Uh, this is a panel on uh, the great sort of, um, you know, what is happening in uh, Asia, uh, the rise of China, US-China policy, India turns east. Uh, Dr. Frederick Rahr has re recently come out with the book on the subject, India turns east and US-China rivalry. Uh, but this is going to, of, of, of course, incorporate that and go beyond and discuss uh, what is happening around uh, East Asia, South Asia, and, and Central Asia, and how it fits into the global politics. And we are extremely uh, pleased uh, that, is, that our senior journalist, uh, Mr. Kora Hussain, is the moderator for this session. Uh, he works for, for Don Newspaper, and I'm sure a lot of you are his fans. Uh, so I should now turn over to Kuram to lead the session. Thank you. Many thanks for that introduction, Yakub, and uh, thanks to everybody to, for attending. Thanks also to our uh, panelists, Dr. Frederick Greer and Musaddiq Malik, uh, for being here. Um, in 2009, there was something like 9,000 Chinese people living and working in Pakistan. By about 2015 or 2016, that number had gone up to 30,000. In 2009, the, Pakistan, the gap between Pakistan's uh, demand for and supply of electricity was somewhere around 7,000 plus megawatts. And many of you, I'm sure, remember the, the, the days of load shedding in that time. Uh, today, in November, the government proudly announced that we are now uh, surplus in uh, electricity and um, all of the incremental uh, power generation capacity has come from Chinese investments. The footprint of China in Pakistan is growing in a huge, at, at, a, at an accelerating pace, and uh, it, this footprint includes the rising number of Chinese living and working in Pakistan, as well as the rising amount of dollar value of investment uh, coming from China. And one of the uh, things I keep trying to emphasize in my writings as well is that this is only the beginning. In November is when CPEC actually began. Uh, many people tend to confuse CPEC with the power plants, but the power plants are only the early harvest projects. The real game in CPEC will begin when the special economic zones become functional, and the uh, investment in other areas such as plastics and petrochemicals and uh, textiles and agriculture and cement and fertilizer all begins to materialize over here. Um, so the real game is actually at the very beginning, but where is this game taking us is something that uh, I think there's been inadequate reflection of. Uh, over here. Um, number the, but the second thing that there has been uh, um, limited debate on, we've debated, for instance, uh, around CPEC, we have debated, for instance, the quantum of uh, outflows that are going to be generated by all this investment coming in. There's been uh, a number of uh, very big voices that have weighed in on this question, that we are absorbing all this investment. What about the outflows? What about when the bill comes due? What will be the amount that we will have to pay back? Uh, certain back of the envelope cal calculations that were done based on the limited amount of information available yielded the figures between three to four billion dollars per, per annum at its peak would be the quantum of outflows that Pakistan will see when these, oper when these investments assume commercial operations. A uh, short while later, the government came in with its own figure, which was about, about 3.45 billion as well, hitting a peak slightly above 4 billion or so. Uh, so that's about the extent of the debate that we have seen around CPEC and around the growing Chinese presence in Pakistan as uh, this uh, uh, enterprise gets underway. One of the things that has not been debated adequately, I believe, is the foreign policy implications of uh, this growing Chinese embrace that Pakistan is rushing into. And if you recall back to the time when President Xi Jinping came to Pakistan and addressed the parliament over here, if you go back and listen to that speech carefully, it's a one hour long speech, and if you listen to it carefully, you'll notice something. You'll notice that one third of the time he spent talking about the friendship between China and Pakistan, the deepest, deeper than the deepest oceans and, uh, and all that. One third of the time he spent talking about China and Pakistan, specifically the nature of the investments and uh, the nature of uh, China's economic interest in Pakistan. The remaining one third, the last one third of his speech, the thought that he left us with, He's talked about South Asia. He talked about the regional implications of CPEC, and he talked about the foreign policy implications. And one line that he mentioned in there is that as this embrace between China and Pakistan grows, uh, 
China and Pakistan are going to fly together in all international forums in terms of their foreign policy, that there is going to be a growing alignment in the foreign policies of China and Pakistan as these countries embrace each other more and more. What are the implications of this? Uh, and what exactly does that mean? I don't think this question has been adequately uh, raised or adequately debated in our public discourse um, at all. We've been focused excessively on the power plants, uh, somewhat on the roads, and then the whole conversation tends to be about connectivity uh, between Pakistan and Central Asia, rather than the impact on Pakistan and its, its economy and its foreign policy. So it's very actually good to have Dr. Frederick Blair here, who has written about uh, um, yeah, whose book is whose book is uh, book's title is actually uh, uh, the title of this panel as well, the that India looks east China U S relations, um, and I want to invite Dr. Greer initially to please share some thoughts on what do you see wh what is the view from India from Delhi when they look west they look at Pakistan and they see this growing embrace between China and Pakistan which is economic and military in nature. Uh, what, what is the view from, uh, from uh, Delhi of this growing reality? Well, thank you very much. Well, I've partly answered this question in my previous presentation, but nevertheless, I will try to go a little further. Uh, first of all, I think there is a commonality of view between Pakistan and India as far as China's presence is concerned. That is the feeling that the real stake uh, for their bilateral relation is strategic. We'll speak about the economics later, but I think this is part and parcel of the same larger strategic issue, in a way. And I'm really, certainly, uh, uh, this is definitely not just that, this is definitely uh, uh, not likely to remain just that, but there is this dimension. And every, everything in Delhi is seen through that dimension. Uh, I mean, and there is no mystery that the Indians are unhappy about it. They have made it amply clear uh, for, uh, for them uh, an increased Chinese presence in Pakistan means an additional constraint on what it can do, what cannot do. Although if you look at their past policies, you wonder what is it that they would do without the Chinese presence they wouldn't do otherwise, or to the contrary, what is it that they would try to do that they haven't tried because they decided not to, and so on and so forth. Their position officially is that they do oppose CPEC, for example, because it crosses disputed territory. Well, this will be disputed on that side of the border, but that's not the question. I'm just referring to what is India's position or what is that I know of India's position on this. Are they unhappy about the whole thing? Yes, obviously. Are they unhappy about Pakistan nuclear program? Yes, of course. So, you know, that question is a bit of a rhetorical a rhetoric question because, yes, they are unhappy about it. Okay. Uh, come back to that in a minute. Uh, let me invite Dr. Musaddiq Malik, uh, Special Advisor to the Prime Minister, uh, to also share his thoughts on the foreign policy implications and uh, other aspects of the growing embrace between China and Pakistan. Thank you very much. I think from our perspective, the story is much less, much clearer and, and not terribly cluttered. We are a very large country, about 207 million people growing between 2 and 3 percent. We have an age bulge, we have a youth, an enormous age bulge which is coming into the labor market for which we don't have any jobs. So from our perspective, from our political perspective, from our internal perspective, we need to set our country on a trajectory which would create enormous numbers of mid-skilled jobs and hopefully at some point in time high-skilled jobs. But certainly at the present time, point in time, mid-skilled jobs and lower-skilled jobs. And our strategy for that is CPEC. It's as simple as that. That's it. Why CPEC? Because CPEC is employment intensive. Everything that we have done, what have we done? We've built roads, we're building roads. What is, what are roads? Roads are clearly very clearly employment intensive. We're setting up power plants. What is a power plant? Power, power plant is a civil works project of about $1,000 million. Every pro power project that we are setting up is about $1.8 to $2 billion, $2,000 million. It's like raising a city. And if anyone has gone to Saival, you've seen these cities getting raised from earth, from nothing. 
And what does that do? That creates employment for people. What kind of employment? Laying bricks, building walls, foundations, etc., etc. That's employment for us. So we are basically generating large-scale employment through CPAC, which is a critical issue that we have. We believe that the time is right and there's convergence. There's convergence between Pakistani viewpoint and the Chinese viewpoint. Now, that is not at the expense of other viewpoints. This viewpoint, this convergence is not at the expense of the United States or the West or India, our neighbor, or Kabul. This is in addition to all the other relationships that we have. Where is the convergence? I would begin with the previous panel's discussion of memories and a sense of um, identity and so on and so forth. So first I would take that viewpoint. And Chinese are right now talking about Belt and Road Initiative. And what is Belt and Road Initiative? Belt and Road Initiative is Silk Route. And what is Silk Route? Silk Route is that glorious time when China ruled. When China was a superior civilization or one of the superior civilizations. So China wants to restore herself. China wants to restore herself to that position that it once had, or even if it did not have, in the Chinese narrative states that it had that position. And they want to restore yourself, redignify themselves to that position. And if they're going to build that Silk Route, what falls in the way? One of the country that fortunately falls in its ways is Pakistan, one of the countries, not the only country, but one of the countries. So we are one of the candidate countries. So that's the first point of convergence. The second point of convergence is Chinese internal stability. The amount and the quantum of disparity that exists between the western provinces of China and the eastern provinces of China are simply unsustainable. Let me say it again. It is simply unsustainable. If a person living in western China, western provinces of China falls sick and goes into the hospital and gets inpatient care, just the pharmaceutical component, the medications component, is equivalent to six months of the person living in the Western province's salary. One illness event, going to the hospital, just one component of that hospitalization, the medical care, the pharmaceutical care, is 50% of, of the salary of the person living in the Western province. Compare this now with Shanghai and the bullet trains and the research universities and buzz and lights and trees and towers. It's unsustainable. This kind of disparity, this kind of Guinea coefficient is simply unsustainable. So it is imperative upon China to build its western provinces, about give or take 200 million people. And therefore, the second point of convergence, the only way of connecting these 200 million Chinese to the rest of the world in the way of exports, in the way of trade, in the way of diffusion of technology, knowledge, movement back from the eastern province to the western provinces or the central provinces. We are fortunate. It goes through CPAC. The third point of convergence is simply economic. And here, the first generation of growth in China from our perspective came from exports. Very soon they realized that they have such a formidable market share of exports across the world that they cannot continue to have double-digit growth through exports alone. So they started to do domestic unleashing or consumerism. So the second generation of economic growth came from domestic unleashing. And in the process of one and two stages, first and the second stage, they accumulated the world's largest reserves. So their third generation of growth is coming from investments. And it's not an accident that China is investing only in countries, only in countries which are poised to have 6 to 10 percent economic growth rate, GDP growth rate. They're not investing in Europe with 2 percent growth rate. They're not investing in the United States. They're not buying hotels like the Middle East. They're investing in Africa. They're investing in countries which are poised to grow between 5% to 7%, 8%, 10%, and Pakistan happens to be one. So this is the third point of convergence. And the fourth one is a, I'm a little bit ambiguous about, which is the foreign policy component, which is your question. Uh, not tricky, but treacherous question, but let me try to answer the treachery. This is where I'm personally also confused, because here's how I see it. First of all, in a cliched manner, cliched manner, I would say, that Pakistan is to China what, what India is to the United States. 
in a cliched manner china would like to build up pakistan to make sure that there's a countervailing force to india just the way the united states would like to build india to a point where there's some kind of countervailing force to to um, to india now what i'm going to say is paradoxical and ironic i believe that both china and in china and there is a there is a common if i talk to the intelligentsia in pakistan i hear well pakistan is on the chinese camp and chinese camp is against the american camp no the chinese camp is not against the american camp who says the chinese camp is against the american camp if china wants pakistan to be a countervailing force to india then a strong us pakistan relationship suits china because that sets the natural limit to the kind of relationship that the us can have with india if pakistan has a good relationship with india then china cannot have as fantastic or glamorous a relationship as india would like to have with the united states and therefore the relationship pakistan us relationship sets a limit or sets a cap on the kind of relationship that india can have with the united states so it is therefore in the interest of pakistan as well as in the interest of china to have a decent relationship with the united states so that's the first possible uh, there's plenty to discuss here but uh, um, frederick i'm sure you you found many, much in here to comment on but specifically do you think the china india uh, china pakistan relationship is comparable in any way to the us india relationship i think so do you remember that in 2005 uh, the us announced a policy of deifenation of their relations clearly there was a double component on the one side it did allow the americans to announce the the us india civilian uh, nuclear relationship on the other side it did allow the us to uh, deliver uh, fighter aircraft to to pakistan so this deifenation by and large has not been questioned so far at least not officially and this is this has never totally begun uh, a zero sum game whether it will become that's a different story but we're definitely not there and i don't disagree with most of what you said uh perhaps with a caveat uh, precisely because of this deifenation which is that you know uh a strong us pakistan may be an additional irritant in the uh, india us india is not going to be an impediment is not going to be is not going to constrain it in a major way uh but do do i certainly agree agree with everything else you said regarding uh, china regarding uh, pakistan having no interest whatsoever in having a bad relation with the united states okay and uh, do you think that when india looks at China's rise and China's entry into Pakistan and China's growing embrace of Pakistan. Do you think that 1962 remains the prism? Do you think it remains a, a stumbling block, uh, con especially considering that when you look out from Delhi, pa Pakistan is not the only country where the Chinese presence is growing. There are countries around India. Uh, is there, uh, you know, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Nepal? The same thing is happening. uh do you think uh, there is a sense of encirclement of uh, of siege that has that may be driving the apprehensions and the memories of 1962 are feeding into it well the memories of 1962 are difficult to assess a because uh yes in a way 62 has affected uh india not so much militarily but psychologically I mean the Indian foreign policy became reactive after 62 for quite some time. This was no longer Nehru's flamboyant uh, pan-nationalism and so on and so forth, right? To which China by the way was supposed to be part of. Uh militarily we're no longer in the post 1962 era. Uh both countries know that they have absolutely no interest in fighting each other and behave accordingly. So we're likely to see uh new tensions and so on. Uh is it likely to go any further that i'm not totally convinced of the third element is uh, this sort of competition for influence on the periphery of india as well as on the periphery of china uh, remember that if if china is strong in myanmar the relation between japan and india have never been that strong and so on so that game continues does that mean that everybody is trying to uh, well this is definitely not a military strategic alliance you know this is uh, 
an influence game. Everybody is trying to get an age on the other and so on and so forth. That continues. By and large, the relationship that every single country of the periphery of China, and that includes India, right, but that includes also Pakistan, that includes everybody, is a, uh, is a relationship in which everyone wants to benefit from China growth, wants to entertain good economic relationship with China, and at the same time is to some extent concerned. So the relationship and the balance between those two elements uh, it's, it's not the same anywhere, everywhere. I mean, it's clearly not the same here and the same in Delhi. It's probably not the same in Rangoon and in Delhi. It's not the same in, uh, in the Philippines and it, uh, than it is here and so on and so forth. But, but the basic uh, structure of the relationship is the same just everywhere. Okay. Musadi, how much do we know and how do we really know where CPEC is really taking us? CPEC, from our perspective, is a bet that we've placed in our, on our future generations. CPEC is not an accounting operation. So anyone who looks at CPEC Wait, is, from... Is it a bet or is it a gamble? It's a bet. You can what call it a gamble. I don't know. Bet is calculated. Gambles are up in the air. We've calculated it. And that's why we believe, very firmly believe, that it's a bet. And it's a bet that we've, produced, that we've placed on our youth and on our future. Let me interrupt you there for a minute. If we are betting or slash gambling with the future of our youth and of their future generations as well, and you're saying it's a calculated bet, where are the, what are the calculations based on? How much do we know about, materially know about what China intends to build over here under the rubric of CPEC? This is the colonial suspicion that Pakistan has, that anyone who comes in is here to colonize and God knows what is going to happen. 9,000 Chinese and now we have 30,000 Chinese. Have you guys gone to Dubai, anyone in the audience? Have you ever seen two people who believe in the same God, speak the same language, have the same color of the skin? Are they suspicious? Have you gone to London? Have you gone to New York? Have you, have you gone to other parts of the world? Do people look at foreigners with this kind of suspicion that 7,000 of them are going to take over? No one is taking over. And what are they going to take over? So my view is, so my view is, so my personal view is that diversity is a virtue. Let's for the first time celebrate that diversity. Look at the treatment of women in Pakistan. Let's diversify. Let's di diversify our gender roles. Let's diversify our religious roles. Let's entertain and in be inclusive of the minorities. Let people come to Pakistan. It is not a bad place and people who are coming in are not bad people. If there are opportunities here, they will come. You want to shut them out, go back to doing nothing. Do nothing, no one would come. Ever since basically the Afghan war, no, has been no one other than the intelligence agencies have been coming to Pakistan. So let it be. Let's close, let's build even thicker and higher walls so that no one can cross over. And only one colored skin and one language and one religion stays. Let's do that. But my suspicion is that we've already played that game. Let's not play that anymore, any further. Now my view on your fundamental question. The first question, the bet, if you want me to answer we have placed a bet on our youth and we have placed a bet on our future. This is what I said. Now let me create a counter argument. What are we doing? This is the argument that our moderator is going to ask me, so I'm trying to beat him. We are borrowing money in dollars and we're investing money in instruments that are yielding rupees. So we're building, borrowing dollars and building power, power infrastructure, which is going to sell you electricity in rupees. We're building up road infrastructure and setting tolls, so we're borrowing dollars and we're going to collect rupees. We've set up port and we're going to have port charges, so we're borrowing dollars and we're going to collect rupees. So what is going to happen? We're going to have a lot of rupees and no dollars. And what do we have to do? We have to pay back in dollars. So very soon the world would be knocking at our doors saying, give me my dollars. And we'd say, we have rupees. 
And they would say, but we want our dollars. So we'd go out to buy dollars and what would happen? Dollars would become expensive. Therefore, the rupee dollar parity would get further compromised. Where is the bet now? Because this is the argument against what I was trying to, do, trying to say. Our bet is that as this infrastructure opens up, and what is this infrastructure doing? It is connecting the western provinces of China to Pakistan. It is basically opening up warm waters to countries like China, warm waters for which Russia fought wars for decades. We're putting six lane highways and motorways rather than wars in the way of China, in the way of Russia and Central Asian states to come and trade in warm waters. That's what we're doing for free. No wars, no expanse. We borrow, we set up the infrastructure, you trade, come to our country. That's what we're saying. Once this infrastructure is ready and once this trade begins to flow, we are only going to get, and this is where the bet comes in, we are only going to get our dollars back if our younger generation, they wear their sneakers and backpacks, and they go into China and identify all of those industries and industrial clusters which are simply not viable in China right now because of, their, of, of, their, of, the, of the quality of life improvements. What they did 30 years ago and is no more viable in China, all of those clusters are dying as we speak. I am not talking about stuff that will happen. It is happening as we speak and we are one of the candidate countries. We can go there and get all of that infrastructure of zip making factories and shoe making factories and shawls and jackets and clothing and textile and, 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 and non-electronic toys and sandals and all of those things that they did 20 years ago and they cannot do at their labor cost. We are a candidate country. If our young men and women go there and collaborate with them and do diffusion of technology and and do capital investments and improve the productivity of our industrial sector, we'd have all the dollars in the world to pay back and more, have the employment and have the GDP contribution. That is the calculated bet that we have placed in our people. Frederick, as you can see, there's an abiding optimism in government when they regard the growing relationship with China. But recently, Emmanuel Macron was in China just now. The, the French president. And he said over there that if you want to build a road from China to Europe, that's great, but the road better not turn those whose territory through which it passes into vassals. So clearly, I mean, there's, uh, when the French are regarding China's growing influence, not only in its periphery, but also as far as Eastern Europe and in Western Europe as well, because the Chinese are now wooing France as well, and they've purchased, a, they've built a port in Greece, much like the one that they are building here. Um, there are other countries that are regarding this with skepticism as well. How do you view the optimism uh, that prevails in, uh, in, in Pakistan when they look at China? Uh, the optimism as so well described and so eloquently described by Mossadegh just now. Uh, well, he spoke of sustainability, environmental sustainability, financial sustainability, and so on and so forth. And this is related to your question. I mean, whenever a country takes uh, equity uh, in the partner country, uh, knowing full well that even if it does in the face of it take equity in any given project, but the sovereign guarantee as such, that one, at one stage it might turn into actual debt then uh, there are questions to be asked. Now, the question, uh, and that's the way people look at the, uh, at the, Chinese, uh, the Chinese BRI project. Now, there might be as many elements of irrationality as you mentioned earlier. I mean, people are never comfortable with an emerging figure, be it China or being somebody else, but nevertheless, there is also a rationale behind it because we have started calculating that this may, at the end of the day, cost people more than it will actually benefit them. Now, I do have a question regarding your previous intervention, which I also find extremely eloquent, but at the same time, if you do import uh, dying technologies from China or dying companies from China, industries from China, and I understand the logic, provide immediately jobs to uh, a use which desperately needed. How do you accompany those, uh, this 
prime effort mm -hmm. to respond to your short-term needs. Uh, are you accompanying it in order to make sure that Pakistan at some stage benefits from that but precisely integrate the technological transfer that China may or may not, but may eventually bring into the country? I mean, is it accompanied by an effort in education, uh, uh, lower education, medium education, higher education, and so on? I mean, wh what is the strategy behind that? Or is that just a short-term thing? We benefit from whatever they want to get rid of. <clears throat> so let me, let me say the following. First of all, sectors and clusters are not competitive. Companies are. The oldest technology in the world, the oldest industry in the world is leather. Man came out of the cave, shot down, hunted, got a deer, ate the deer, and then used the leather to, to cover herself or himself. And where is the leather cluster of the world? Italy, as well as in France. The highest leather fashion across the world, the highest value addition in the leather industry across the world is in Italy and France. The oldest industrial thing ever, leather. It is the value that you create. What they are getting rid of are not dying industries because when would be a time when the kids would stop playing with the toys? When would be the time when a man or a woman would stop wearing sandals? Or when would be a time when the stitching would go out of fashion and men and women would wear something that is unstitched? There are only limited number of toga parties, so you can't imagine a world just going around toga. So to the extent that this textile, these garments are going to be consumed by the rest of the world, the only thing that we are saying is that our labor costs are lower than those of China, and that China is no more competitive in some of these industrial sectors in which enormous fashion, enormous value addition can be done. In the short run, our strategy is that we would just take, do diffusion of technology. We would not do innovation because we don't have the innovation ecology. But we have the wherewithal to, to basically diff, have the, to, to, so to say, what is the inverse of diffusion? To accept, so to say, these technologies which are 30 years old. I mean, we are, you've seen Pakistan. These people are fully capable of working in stitching plants and working in toy factories and zip, zip lines and so on and so forth and sandal manufacturing companies and designing stuff and writing communications about them and marketing. You've seen Pakistan. I think Pakistan is capable of doing it. We're saying, we get, if we get this opportunity in round one, we would basically have the existing clusters which are no more economically viable in China come to Pakistan. And that gives us the breathing space, 20 years or 30 years of breathing space to build up the human capital that is essential for biotechnology and nanotechnology and, and, and infotechnology and so on and so forth. So that gives us the breathing space. That also gives us the money to invest. We are already investing quite a bit. I mean, you may be surprised to know we are not doing effect, producing effective outcomes, but every single province of Pakistan, every single province, in spite of our political polarization and rhetoric, is spending about 30% of its budget on education. So very clearly we need to invest more, but even more clearly we need to produce better outcomes with what we are investing. But we are investing. And as we get more economic freedom, as these clusters come here and our young entrepreneurs, young men and women like yourself, you go out and get all that, get, give us that economic breathing space, we'd invest more in our higher education, we'd invest more in our general education, we'd invest more in our uh, uh, skills development programs. But skills development programs come with the diffusion of technology. So as technology gets diffused, as new machines come here, you would see how the skills naturally, rather than going to the schools, at the factory floors, the skills would get developed and our industrial cluster would become more and more and more productive. And productivity is the only thing that can get out of, get us out of this trap of, of, of poverty. Musadik, is capital the only thing that 
workers are looking to relocate? I mean, if they relocate the machinery here for our workers, what happens to their workers who've been working in these industries? All Only time? for the industries which are no more viable. They're not stupid. If they could basically create large scales because they have over a billion people. So what do they do with the workers who've been working in their own textile and leather industries where they relocate the capital? What happens to their workers? Isn't that the Chinese problem? Uh, and how are they going about solving that? How would I know? So I'm not Chinese know. yet. Uh, would, would but my view is, to relocate the labor but my view is, is, my view is, my view is. they're looking to relocate the labor with No, the I don't think so. I mean, that's the Pakistani suspicion from its colonial experience. And even in the high times of, colon, of when Pakistan was a colony, there were only a handful of, 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 of the United Kingdom people, I don't want to call them. European with broad stroke who came to Pakistan, most of the people working were brown and my skin. So we'd continue to work. It's highly unlikely that the China would come to Pakistan and then we, uh, the next question is where would the Pakistanis go to China? So my view is that China has perpetually, continuously moved up the value chain, continuously. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, China was textile, shoes, leather, and all of the things that I'm talking about. And now the formidable presence of China is in the middle tier. It's in, in the infrastructure, in building roads, in building bridges, in building infrastructures, in telecommunications, in IT. And they're formidable globally in these things. But they're still not terribly competitive in, in genotyping, in, 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 in biotechnology. So they are middleware, we are capturing the lower rung, and they would like to move to the higher end, and we'd continue to move up as well. Okay. I think uh, Frederick had a response to that, and then we're going to take a few questions from the floor. I, th I think you very eloquent avoided my question, uh, which was the step that you intend to do to accompany this. I fully understand, yes, I, I fully understand the logic of what you say. Uh, I have no disagreement with it. You'll get some breathing space in terms of employment, in terms of capital, in terms of whatever is needed. Technology, but first of all, I mean, you mentioned the, uh, the example of leather. Even the leather industry, even if it's traditional industry, whatever textile in general and so on, I mean, has to evolve if it wants to remain competitive, and therefore this need for uh, more skilled employees, creativity, and so on, has to be there. And what you have not answered is the way you intend to do it. This is fine to say the companies will, uh, will uh, do it by themselves. There will be a diffusion of technology in the process, and I certainly agree. But before we do have such an investment that it does uh, meet your requirement in terms of employment like this, use population is going to take time, and I don't see you pretending that it would anyway, right? The second thing is, there is also a regulatory framework that you didn't address in, the, in your answer, which makes uh, a necessity for companies to become more competitive. Uh, and so far, uh, one of the main problem of, as I understand it, at least of Pakistan's economy, is that precisely uh, the private sector live in sort of a cocoon where it's largely protected, benefited from the uh, whatever it can from the state and so on and so forth. I mean, I don't see how, uh, simply because the capital is imported from China, uh, this would change if you don't change the regulatory framework as well. So maybe you plan to do it, but you haven't said so. Perhaps we could enlighten us about that. Well, uh, I want to open the floor to discussions, but uh, I think there's uh, very little to say about reforms taking place on the regulatory no, side. No, 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 no. But okay, no, but no, before no, we give you a chance on that, okay. before we give you a chance on that, there is a question, and uh, the, the, the lady in the second row, you had your hand up, so I'd like to come to you on this. Uh, do we have a mic out there on the floor? Can we ask you to project? Or uh, would you like to borrow my mic? Yes? Go ahead. When we talk about the governments of UAE, etc., they are very strong governments. You did say that we have to not consider the political scenario, but as an educationist myself, I don't see anything in place for developing education further, although you did say that there were 30 whatever million billions being spent. I don't see any percentage improvement in the education and also the skill building to take in whatever Russia, China would bring. I mean, I would, first of all, I would, I have never claimed that Pakistan has an ace uh, educational system. I don't believe I've said that. 
So the bottom line is that the fact, the reason why I'm saying we are going after mid-skilled jobs or lower-skilled jobs is because we have done an audit on our skills. If we had not done the audit on our skills, then we would also be talking about nano and biotechnology, and I haven't said a word about it. Because having three professors in 17 universities who do nano or biotechnology does not make us a center for biotechnology. And I've listened to a lot of that nonsense and I don't buy that. We need another generation to get there. But we need to have an aspiration that we can chase. And we have that aspiration. But we are also not totally divorced from our realities, which is why everything that we are doing requires low-skilled to medium-skilled jobs, everything. We have programs of skills development that I can independently share with you, which are not terribly effective, but we are getting there. And we don't want to move Pakistan forward through stringent regulations because that's the natural house for Pakistan. That's what we've done for 70 years. We want to regulate greed only, and we'd have the competition and the markets drive where they may go. That's our strategy. Very quickly, can I just ask you yes or no? Are you satisfied with the answer that he gave? No. Um, but perhaps you can, you, but you're satisfied. Okay. Um, we have a question show, up here. Let's do a show of hands. Uh, I'm going to do a show of hands. I'm going to do a show of hands at the end, actually. We will do a show of hands, but we have a question uh, up here. Two brief questions. Could you introduce yourself first? Uh, my name is Shakil. I work in Islamabad. Uh, I have two quick questions from Dr. Musaddiq. Uh, first of all, are Pakistani visa regulations strictly enforced on Chinese? For example, I've heard that they come here on a visit visa and stay here for two years or three years. And the other is, do we need uh, Chinese help to get our people off the, to keep our people off the terrorist list? Can't we use the good offices for better purposes? What was the second do we need Chinese help to keep our people off the terrorist list? I think the reference is to the vote in the UN regarding uh, one terrorist organization, Masood Hazar. You know, I, I personally don't have a lot of information on it because I don't deal with the Ministry of Interior. I can check and get back to you. I honestly don't know. I know there was a case where there were people who were on visit visa and they were caught and they were killed and so on and so forth a short while ago, after which this visa regime conversation became very active. Uh, I personally think that if I get a Shenzhen visa, no one regulates me. Other than the fact that I cannot do, I cannot take a job whether I go to a synagogue or go to a mosque or go to a church or go to a university or go to a, uh, go to a, to, to, to a restaurant, no one stops me. I don't think we need to have a visa regime which is so restrictive that you came here for visit and why are you visiting an industrial sec uh, company or you came here for on, 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 the, on, on, the, on the visa to do business and why are you going into the universities. I don't think we need that kind of visa regime but I do believe that even people in our own government believe that this kind of enforcement is needed. I think this is 1980, this is not 1984 George Orwell, you know, where the big brother is watching over everything. We don't need that. And what was your second question? Look, we need, we, we're doing what we need to do. I mean, we, we believe very firmly that in the 1990s we made wrong policies and we have a lot of uh, debris of those policies that we're cleaning up. But we incrementally cleaning it up and we'll get there. We have a question over here. My question is uh, about the entire, you know, discussion, and I want to ask both of the panelists this question: that how does uh, CPEC affect Balochistan? Because it has not been discussed here in this uh, discussion. It has been a civil unrest, and uh, I wonder how it will affect uh, internationally and, you know, internally within the China and Pakistan's relationship. Well, how does CPEC affect Balochistan nationally and internationally? Nationally, it's very difficult to say. How many reports do we get? I mean, are journalists very free to go to Balochistan? Not that I know of. Are journalists ready to report about Balochistan? Not that I know of. Uh, and whoever reports about it and whoever talks about it, you know, sometimes is suspicious in the eyes of many people. Internationally, I don't see one should uh, exaggerate the impact if Balochistan had been an international issue, then uh, that would have been noticed, and so far I haven't really observed that. Uh, one may regret it, uh, but so far this is not an international issue. 
You see, the question, the fundamental question that need to be answered is, is Balochistan better off with development or without development? Is de Balochistan better off with the industrial footprint or without the industrial footprint? Is the same kind of question that was being asked before. Over a period of time, if basically the roads are going to, if Gawadar has to be connected to Khuzdar, then all of the roads have to go through Balochistan. Now, if the suspicion is that all of these roads that are going to go through Balochistan, Balochis would have no participation in that, I'm willing to entertain that question simply because of the high-handedness of our policies over the past 70 years, first towards Bangladesh and then towards the smaller provinces. But the fact, the rational argument, is that if development would take place, then local people would participate in the development. It has happened, happened everywhere in the world. Why would Balochistan be an exception? The sense of alienation that Balochistan has, I think, is well warranted. So there are two arguments. One is the political argument, which is well warranted, and the suspicion, which is well warranted. The second is the rational answer that if development takes place and skills are needed for the labor and the local labor gets skills development, there's already around Gawada the largest skills development program in Pakistan and the industrial uh, clusters. So if the suspicion is that all of the people who are going to build roads and all of the people who are going to work in these factories and all of the people who are going to get skilled are non balochis I think it's a good political argument, but rationally speaking, they would participate, there would be development, and Balochis would benefit the most from it. This is my viewpoint. Take our last question from here, and then I want to do a quick show of hands. I'm sorry, but time is a factor here. And the next panelists about um, My question is for Musaddaq. Uh, earlier on, you said that uh, what Pakistan is to China, so India is same to the US. I disagree, I disagree on this point. I think what Pakistan is to China, the same Israel is to the US. Please comment. No, I, do, I, do, I don't understand. I honestly don't understand the question. Uh, I don't think we have the same kind of lobbying of the Chinese in Pakistan as Israel has in the United States. I don't believe Pakistan has fought any or, or China has fought any battles or has lobbied as hard for Pakistan anywhere. There is no example of what you have said uh, across the board. I think China takes a very long view and is a very patient country and does not easily get provoked, nor does it give any provocative answers politically or internationally or diplomatically. It speaks with it in quietness. And it speaks to us and the international community in a very kind of sober tone. And I think their play is very long run. So I do, no, I do not agree with your, with your analogy. I would like to say one thing towards the end. I would need one minute. Okay. One minute, I'm sure we'll be able to find. Very but quick we have one, we're going to squeeze in one more question. Hassan, um, my, my question to Dr. Sadakji. Uh, um, if, if the Chinese were to move those industries which you are saying are declining or are uh, not needed then, won't Vietnam or countries like Bangladesh be better options than Pakistan? They very clearly are. And that is why you, if you remember, every line that I stated, I said, we are one of the candidate countries, remember that. And if we have this attitude, they have many choices. So we have to revise our attitudes as well. I mean, there was a professor who was writing the chalk fell from his hand. He said, damn gravity. Then he bent down, he picked the chalk up, he looked at the class and he said, but you know what? Gravity doesn't care. So you don't want the Chinese? They will go elsewhere. You don't want their investment? That investment will go elsewhere. If you want that investment, the responsibility that we have is that of deploying it in productive sectors in an extremely productive manner. That responsibility is ours. Okay, one minute each for closing statements. Should we start? You, you said you had something to say for one minute. I'm going to time you and uh, one minute. Here you go. I've never been able to say anything in one minute. So you can time me as much as you want. <laughs> Look, what I haven't told you is the underbelly of my argument. And I think honesty demands and integrity demands that I lay out that underbelly as well. Everything that I've said 
Everything that I've implied means that Pakistan's foreign policy improves. If Pakistan wants to trade with Central Asia, the only way to Central Asia is either through Afghanistan or through Iran. And if Pakistani, Iran and Afghanistan policy does not allow for it, then all of my arguments Man, I told you this would not go through. <laughs> so if we are unable to do this trade, I think we would be at a loss. Everything that I have said assumes that we would build up a productive sector, which was your question. We are unable to build productivity into our industrial footprint, into our commercial footprint into our port infrastructure, I think we would be at a loss. But the most important thing is that we, if we want to progress, as I said, if our end game is employment, productivity, end game is growth, end, gro end, 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 end game is to have a higher quality of life for our children and leave behind a better country than the country in which, for our children than the country in which we are living then we will have to revise many of our policies. And those policies, particularly the foreign policies, are the underbelly to our economic development program. Well, how could I not agree with that entirely? Uh, and I do, and I do. But I think that if you add up the ifs on the economic sector, on the social sector, on the societal sector and on the foreign policy front, that's a lot of if. So I would certainly concede uh, a two things. That first, from a Pakistani perspective, I do get the logic and I understand it, but there are also questions which are being put, and in practical terms at least, whatever the intention, so far, largely unanswered. That's one point. The second is, uh, all that requires also a degree of political stability which at least seen from outside is far from being insured. And from what we see uh, outside, there is a lot of, it's not so much just the foreign policy, is the political, uh, in domestic political dynamic underlying this foreign policy which is very much at stake and which will condition of that. Until there is clarity, uh, yes, we can all wish, and I, once again, I do get your logic. I don't think it's a flawed one. I think that there are still questions to be answered. And I think you will partly agree with what I said. But at the same time, there are too many ifs in behind that, including in starting with probably the political one to see things with too much confidence. So we'll understand if you say we'll take one step at a time, because that's the way things have to be done, there is no escape to that. But that's about it. We're, we're making all of these decisions, sorry, just to, <laughs> No, I'm saying, I'm in agreement with you, but we cannot just put our heads in the sand. We have our constraints, we have our aspirations, we have a lot of ifs, and each of those ifs demands, commands, and we're committed to a therefore. Okay, we uh, began this conversation by noting the massive increase in ch the Chinese presence in Pakistan between uh, over the past one decade. Over the next decade, this is going to become even bigger and bigger. It's going to grow exponentially. So if we went from 9,000 to 30,000 now, we are going to, in all likelihood, be going mu you know, much more than tripling that number over the next uh, five, six, seven, eight years. Nevertheless, uh, I want to now do a quick show of hands here. We have actually two points of view uh, that you've uh, just heard regarding this growing embrace between China and Pakistan that is going to get tighter and tighter in years to come. How many of you feel or how many of you agree with the point of view advanced by Frederick that there are questions to be asked when you do this and how many of you agree with the point made by Mossadegh that have some faith uh, we don't have, we have limited choices in this engagement and we have no choice but to move forward and have faith we are doing the best we can. So let's try, let's start with this. How many of you believe that there remain, after listening to this discussion, that there are still questions to be asked? That's a lot of questions. Okay, uh, thanks. And how many of you feel uh, reassured and feel that, yes, we should have some faith, we have limited options, and just move forward the way the government is taking us? 
not bad. But I think the questions win at the moment. So, Musadik, I think as we move forward, uh, we will. Uh, you should expect that I think the majority of people in the country will take Frederick's advice. Uh, questions will continue to be raised, and we are blessed with a free press, uh, and we are blessed with a democratic system in this country. And uh, let CPEC continue to be debated uh, as we move forward. Thanks all for your presence. Sir.